webinar. Um, thank you everybody for joining this webinar. Deep apologies for the technical difficulties. This is one of our monthly webinars to foster a global happiness and well-being movement. And because of the delay, we're just going to cut to the chase. And thank you so much, Alexandra, for, for joining us. And I pass it over to you. So thank you very much to, to Laura and to everybody for your patience and for being here. Um, thank you for listening to the podcast. And as you probably already know, I'm very happy to be here. But what does that really mean, happiness? I'd like to talk a little bit about happiness, to talk about the different ways it has been approached, all the different meanings of happiness, maybe give you a little tiny bit of the neuropsychology behind the different forms of happiness, and uh, just a little tiny bit about some approaches to increase happiness from a psychological point of view, and then open up to uh, questions or comments. So, in preparing for this talk and other talks I have given about the topic, I, by the way, I am a uh, professor of uh, psychology at Antioch University, Seattle, the doctoral program. And sometimes we talk about this this topic, and I've been very interested in what the Happiness Initiative has been doing here in Seattle. So I've been keeping up with the literature about happiness, and I found that um, when I did a little search about happiness, there were over 5,000 titles about happiness. And as you can imagine, they did not all agree with each other, and some were very learned, and some were just plain funny, like happiness lessons from a weasel. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to put a little bit of organization into this vast amount of literature that exists. And I will try to talk about the different meanings of um, happiness. And just to warm us up, I thought I'd give you a couple of very differing opinions about happiness. And she says, concerning life, the wisest men of all ages have judged it alike. It is no good. Always and everywhere, one has heard the same sound from their mouth, a sound full of doubt, full of melancholy, full of weariness of life, full of resistance to life. He does not believe that happiness is possible in this life. On the other hand, the Dalai Lama says that happiness is the purpose of life and it has a very uh, optimistic opinion of this. Of course, in psychology, we have to quote Freud, right? And he believes that the possibilities of happiness are limited from the start by our very constitution. It is much less difficult to be unhappy. And he believes that suffering comes from three quarters, from our own body, from the outer world, and finally, from our relations with other men and human beings. So this whole gamut of different ways of looking at happiness Let's try to put a little bit of, of order into this. Um, and why is that so important? Well, obviously, because the Happiness Initiative has proposed that the measure of happiness be something that is considered in policy making. And even in the Constitution of the United States, right? We're all allowed to pursue happiness. It's a very, very important concept. And just as a little reminder of things that have already been covered in this webinar, there have been measures of happiness posted on the web, and there's a happiness index that everybody is asked and invited to take. And this is the way that the Seattle Initiative measures happiness. They have a number of questions, but these were the most relevant to the direct measure of subjective well-being. It says, please imagine a ladder with steps numbered from zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. Suppose we say that the top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you, and the bottom of the ladder represents the worst possible. On the top step is 10 and the bottom step is zero. On which step of the ladder do you feel you personally stand at the present time? And then you can rate it on a scale of zero, which is the worst, to 10, which is the best possible life for you. And there are three similar ways of measuring happiness, including what that is 
uh, how satisfied are you with life as a whole nowadays? And how happy would you say you are? These kinds of measures have become very important in the global uh, attempt to improve well-being for everybody. And for example, in the 1990s, 42 countries took a survey, and interestingly, everybody rated on the upper half of happiness. The lowest at the time was Bulgaria with a 5.03, and Switzerland at the time was the highest with 8.39. This changes um, at different points in time, and the World Happiness Report from the Birth Institute in 2012, for example, has extensive reports on the happiness in different nations. But what has become obvious is that the way that different people rate happiness is different in different countries. And in fact, it is different when we think of our own happiness. So let's talk about individual, personal happiness and the different meanings that it might have. The first meaning of happiness, which I have called alegria, or joy, or pleasure, is the joy that is brought to us just by the sheer delight that comes from our senses, from our body. And it is kind of like a bubble, a flash in the sky, just a moment, which researchers have known to last about three seconds, and then it fades away. So for about three seconds, we can have this intense experience of happiness, but it will disappear very soon. And this is very different from the more sustained kind of happiness that we discuss at other points. This joy, this pleasure, this bubble has been measured with tweets with the magic of contemporary uh, technology. It sometimes works. People have been asked to report their happiness when they are randomly tweeted during the day. And a researcher and his group, Dodds and his group, have found that if you accumulate the numbers, the number of times that happiness and other synonyms are tweeted during the year, you will get a very consistent report of happiness changing during the year. And he found that there's a gradual trend upward from January to April in terms of happiness. And then it starts trending a little bit down. And he has found that there's been a trend down in happiness from 2008 to 2011, which is the last time that he measured this. Uh, it isn't a very extreme trend, but there is a slow trend downwards to less tweets about happiness. And this is the best way that we know how to capture that three-second bubble by these uh, tweets. Um, we can get more precise than that by accumulating the tweets about happiness, let's say, in a year. We can see that during the year, the happiest times tend to be something like New Year and Valentine's Day and Mother's Day, special occasions. We can also see that during the week, the happiest days of the week, no surprise, are Fridays and Saturdays. And the unhappiest days of the week, now this is a surprise to me, are Tuesdays, followed closely by Mondays. So that's one of the ways that we can look at happiness is this momentary three-second bubble. But it is also possible to speak about happiness as slow. And we can speak of flow as an experience that lasts a lot longer. The author who has spoken the most about flow is a man by the name of Sixth Me Holly. And he believes that flow is something that we experience as if we were in a wave of pleasure. And time disappears. And this is an velvety, lovely experience of timelessness. In fact, we become so absorbed in the experience that we lose all self-consciousness, all distraction, all worries. We're not even aware that we are happy at the time. It is only when we have a little flash of self-consciousness that we can say, oh, we really enjoy that. And later on, 
upon thinking about our experience, we can say, oh, that was a lovely thing. I was really happy. Which leads us to a third meaning of happiness. Besides joy, besides flow, we can also talk about well-being or satisfaction or what I have called felicidad because I need to differentiate it from the other. And this well-being or satisfaction is not just a feeling, but it also involves a cognition of forms of meaning making. And it is something that requires self-awareness, like there is somebody behind the lens saying, this is a happy moment, or I am a happy person. It is what we tell ourselves about happiness. It includes the narratives, the stories, the anecdotes, and the histories that we create. It is, in fact, a way of making meaning. One of the people who has studied this the most, and in fact got a Nobel Prize for it, is Daniel Kahneman. And he talks about the remembering self, which puts together these remembered bubbles of three seconds and perhaps a uh, flow, and starts telling stories about what they mean and who we are in relation to them. So we create these stories in the best sense of the world, where I'm not talking about myths that are lies. I'm talking about abstractions of our experience. So that we can say, oh yes, last January I was very happy, but in May I wasn't so happy. And it is because of this. Um, that kind of meaning making requires not only the senses, but also all of our human ability to make meaning. And so, as you can imagine, moving now to the psychophysiology of this, the psychophysiology gets very complicated because we're talking not only about the pleasure that we experience, but also the motivation. We feel happiest when we make, are living up to the meaning that we uh, set up for ourselves. And we're also learning things. We are learning what are the things that make us happy. And for each of these psychological components, there are different measures that we could use. And they employ different brain circuitry. And I will not linger on this very much. You're welcome to ask a little bit more about this. But let me give you some general examples. We know for that for that three-second bubble that I was talking about earlier, the sensory joy, there is a great deal of involvement of what's been called the limbic system. The limbic system is in the central part of the brain. If we went deep into the very core of the brain, there are a number of systems there that surround it that include things like the amygdala and the thalamus and the hippocampus. And those, that's called the limbic area, and that is very much related to to our sense of pleasure, as are um, the opiate receptors in the brain that also surround but extend further out into the, into the brain. And that's really a basic place where we will feel that intense joy, including a place that we call the nucleus accumbens that is triggered or that is uh, fed by dopamine, the famous dopamine uh, neurotransmitter in, in the brain. But when we are talking about the more complicated happiness, the one that involves meaning making, then we have other areas of the brain that need to be functioning much more. And now I'm talking about the frontal lobes. And if you have access to the screen, you can see a picture of a side view of the brain showing the way that the frontal lobes tend to light up when we are happy in the present. But we can also think about happiness in the past. You know, that's why we take pictures and recall things. Um, and other areas of the brain also light up when we think about that or when we have future projections about what will make us happy and when we think about what we're going to be doing, for example, these holidays, these areas of the brain tend to light up more. 
And so to get a general experience of happiness, the kind that comes from meaning making, we need to have both the limbic system and the frontal lobes involved. Of course, this includes the brain opioid system, which is a system that we have where we create our own opioids inside of the brain and they tend to make us feel happy and relaxed. The other system that is involved in feeling happy and, and relaxed, as I mentioned earlier, is the dopamine system. And it is again in the real central part of the brain. And interestingly, the things that tend to give us satisfaction and make us happy are not necessarily the things that we yearn for. Because we yearn for things that we have created myths or stories or meaning around. And uh, sometimes they bring us happiness and sometimes they don't. So one take home message from this lecture is beware for what you long for because it isn't always what makes you happy. And so you're in for things wisely or you may end up with a closet full of junk. Um, so besides the dopaminergic system, here's a little picture of dopamine, which is a very beautiful, um, a very beautiful molecule. Besides these systems that I have been talking about, the limbic system and the frontal lobe, we also have something that's called the brain default mode network. And the brain default mode network is what it says. It is a place where our brain goes as a default. When we are not concentrating on anything in particular, when we are just kind of like daydreaming and spitting things off, what we are using is the brain default mode network. In fact, when we focus on something in particular, we use less of this brain default mode. And it is mostly in the cerebral cortex in the back part um, of, of the brain, the occipital part, and in the frontal part. And these are always active. But, of course, it is all connected with the frontal lobe and the limbic system. And the default network that I was mentioning earlier is part of what allows us to create stories about who we are and about what we yearn for. And again, when I speak about yearning for things wisely, creating stories about what we really wish in a very wise way, what we are doing is we are working with the brain default mode network. And there is a certain enjoyment in just using the brain default network, even if we are yearning for things that we can never attain. I think that's why there's so many songs about these loves that we can't get to or, or these uh, stories about wishing for happiness but never getting to it. There's something about the journey, something about the pursuit that is very, very appealing. And um, sometimes when we get to the actual thing, it can be frustrating. So very briefly, I would like to speak about some interesting happiness strategies that have been proposed in the literature to try to increase the level of happiness. And I'll just give you a very, very uh, brief digest about it. One of the strategies is called JOE, J-O-E. J stands for joy, O stands for opportunities, and E stands for edifying others. Are we expanding the happiness of others? And this is the recipe that has been given traditionally to, inc to increase happiness, to experience the sensual pleasures of joy, to use all of the opportunities that come our way, and to expand the happiness of others. There is something about perceiving the happiness in others that increases ours. And then we exp experience happiness and increase the happiness of others and everybody wins. So, to uh, summarize a little bit, I've been talking about three different levels of happiness. The alegria or joy or pleasure that is momentary, the sens sensuous life. The flow, that is when we are using our skills at a level that is 
just right, challenging enough and rewarding enough. The well-being of satisfaction that comes from making meaning and uh, ties all of these together. And I'd like to add another level of happiness, one that was mentioned by Aristotle many, many years ago. And he gives the name eudaimonia. More recently, Seligman and the positive psychology folks have been using the word flourishing. And that talks about fulfilling one's true potential. In this level, the eudaimonia is really not a feeling at all. It is more of a moral judgment. When we are using our potential, when we are using our skills in a way that is fruitful and productive, we tend to be very happy, but it is a very cognitive uh, kind of happiness. So, how do we increase that? We found out what we're good at. We'll call those the signature strengths, and we use those as frequently as we can, and that will make us happy in the bigger sense of the world. Now, one of the things that is, I think, very interesting is that these happinesses are not necessarily um, correlated. For example, flow does not correlate with any other form of happiness. We can be in flow a lot, and we can remember that we were happy then, but it doesn't necessarily make us feel more eudaimonic or like we have more meaning in life. And we have, can, can find individuals who specialize in each of these happiness. So some people will be low in joy, but experience a lot of well-being. So they might be uncomfortable, but at the same time have lots of meaning in their life, or the other way around. They might have a lot of sensual pleasures and not be having a lot of meaning. Ideally, we would have all of these. But another take-home message, we need to focus on every single one of them to achieve this overall integrated kind of happiness. So usually when we speak about happiness, we're actually measuring complex information, probably several concepts at one time. And there seems to be something about happiness that is constantly change, changing. So when we attain it, when we attain satisfaction, it, should, it soon will change. So is this meaningful? Of course, yes, very meaningful. It's associated with good health, with longevity, with creativity, with survival. It is associated with uh, fairness and uh, just a general way of being in the world. The happier we are, most people tend to be kind, uh, kinder. And we like that. Happiness and kindness seem to go together. So other ways of enhancing pleasure is to spread it out, to avoid habituation. We have this, uh, this tendency to become used to pleasure. So we have a lovely view from our window. And we first move into this apartment and we keep looking at and looking at the cascade, for example. Eventually, we find out that we get used to it and we stop perceiving them. We might miss them and we, if we are away, but while we're at home, we stop looking at them. So it is a wise strategy to spread out the pleasures and once in a while give us some rest from those pleasures so that we appreciate them again. If you like chocolate, have some time in which you decide not to eat chocolate. So the next time you, you eat chocolate, it tastes even yummier. Another uh, take-home message about uh, pleasure is that comparisons count. We tend to think of ourselves as being happy, but if we compare ourselves to others, sometimes that increases our happiness and sometimes that makes it better. For example, if uh, women in particular have really suffered from comparing themselves to models that appear on TV because they look perfect and they look perfectly happy and then our happiness tends to look oh a little mediocre so watch out who you compare yourself with another thing is in terms of, of creating meaning it's the beginning and the end of things that we remember so we create our meaning with the peak 
experiences, the things that are outstanding, and what happened at the beginning, and what happened at the end. So, for example, when you're planning a vacation, make sure that the beginning of the vacation and the end of the vacation are the highlights. You will remember those best, and you'll make better meaning of your vacation or your experiences by having the peaks at the beginning and the end. Other things, savoring, sharing things with others, taking the time to remember those happy times or to plan for the happy times, allowing yourself to self-congratulate, and when something has gone really well, to note it to yourself and say, yes, I was happy then. It was a meaningful experience. I was using my talents. I was making others happy. I want to note it and maybe even write it down, or take a picture, tweet it, or send it around. All of that contributes to happiness. And to allow for full focus on things also tends to increase happiness. It is a form of savoring, which ex extends the happiness throughout time. As you can hear in all of these concepts, there is the idea of mindfulness behind them. If we are mindful of happiness, it tends to deepen it. We already spoke about using our signature strength, which will increase grat gratification, and to find flow. If there are times when you lose track of time, probably you are in flow and you are doing something that's really good for you. Now, just a couple of uh, things to wrap this up. There are some, thing, some things on the web that you can, you can use to expand on these concepts. One of them is to identify your signature strengths, and you can do that at authentichappiness.ses.upen.edu, uh, where there's a questionnaire that allows you to identify your signature strengths and encourages you to use them more often. And uh, if you can continue to use these strengths over a week, you will find yourself happier. Um, so that's the end of my talk, except to make a couple of suggestions for reading. Of course, Daniel Kahneman for Thinking Fast and Slow is his very accessible book. Jonathan Haidt has The Happiness Hypothesis, which is a lovely book that expands on some of the concepts I have presented. Daniel Gilbert, Stumbling on Happiness, talks about the difference between a yearning and a cheating. The Dalai Lama, The Art of Happiness, talking about compassion and the way our happiness relates to others. Um, Matthew Ricard, which is a Buddhist uh, monk who also is supposed to be the happiest man in the world, has a book called Happiness, A Guide to Developing Life's Most Important Skills. And if you like more about the physiology of happiness, we have Neil Carlson, Carlson's Physiology of Behavior. The 11th edition is the last one. So, uh, that concludes my talk, and what I'd like to do is, if we can figure out a way of um, seeing your questions, I would uh, like to open that up to, to questions. Thank you so much, Alex. Beautiful. Um, so w w here's where we do questions, and we have about uh, t 13 minutes. So if you'd like to have a, uh, ask a question, you can do one of two things. You can raise your hand, or you can type the question into the question box, and then I'll recite it so that everybody can hear it. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask a question, Alex. You mentioned that to be careful for which you long for. So my question is, could you give examples of how we can long for something that does increase our happiness um, and, and what that looks like and how we can long for something and what we would long for that would actually make us feel maybe perhaps unhappy or miserable um, in, in the longer run? Thank you, Laura, for that lovely question because it really ties into the time of the year where we're living. So we're talking about the holidays. And the holidays are times when a lot of people long for a lot of experiences that can be unrealistic and that can really put a crimp in happiness. So for example, if somebody longs for having the perfect Christmas celebration, 
or the perfect meeting with their family, the, the perfect dinner uh, with their fa family, or the perfect Hanukkah, or whatever it is that they long for that is supposed to somehow represent this ideal that is actually unattainable. What happens is that when we show up to the actual meeting or reunion, or when that particular calendar day runs around, we will find ourselves having experiences that do not live up to that which we hoped it would be. And then we tell ourselves that something is wrong, that we are disappointed, that uh, our environment is not what we hoped it to be, when in fact, it was our yearning or setting up these expectations for the perfect gift or the perfect night out. It was our expectations that made it difficult. So it serves us well that when we are daydreaming or when we are thinking about things, we take a more limited approach and know that perfection is unattainable and know that a lot of the images that we get through the media and through other uh, ways of, of of talking to each other, they tend to be things that we really cannot attain. You know, even conversations with friends, it always sounds like people are really happy all the time, or they're all, yeah, and um, it doesn't always reflect that they have times when they are down, or when they have pains and aches, or they get caught in traffic, or whatever it is. Um, things are not always good, but when we're talking about the good times, we make it sound really good to one another. So that yearning for unrealistic things is something that can uh, cause us to create meanings that make us unhappy. And when we yearn for something that is realistic, is that yearning itself, does that make us happy? Or when we achieve that, is that what makes us happy? I mean, that wasn't... Actually, both. Both things. Uh, there's something about the yearning. There's something about the wanting. There's something about the saying, this is the goal I want to achieve. This is what I would like. And just setting that goal can be intensely pleasurable. It can be orienting. It can be very satisfying, just setting up on, on the pursuit of it, the pursuit of happiness. Um, attaining those goals sometimes is very pleasant and sometimes it is not. Um, cooks know this very well. Just the process of cooking, of setting out to make this wonderful souffle or pie or whatever you're making um, can be very pleasurable. And then when you try the food itself, eh, sometimes it lives up to what we hoped for, and sometimes it does not. So they're independent. We can find pleasure in the road, in the process. And we can find pleasure in the actual achievement, but they do not always go together. Beautiful, thank you. So if anybody else has any questions, if you want to put them into the question box, or raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask the questions. That would be great. In the meantime, um, we'll we have recorded this this uh, session, and we'll be putting it up on a um, on a tool that that will allow you to have access to it. You just need to ask myself or Tom to ask for access to Basecamp to be able to see that um, and and to download the recording. Maggie, I see you're asked a question asking a question, so I'm going to unmute you. So, go ahead, Maggie. Hi, um, I actually wanted to ask, there was earlier a bullet point and she spoke a little bit about um, comparing. Um, no, I am sorry, hold on just a second. Uh, I'm going to reinterpret the question for you. So this is part of our, t yeah, this is, so go ahead. Um, Maggie, there was a bullet point about what? About comparing. Uh -huh. And I was really curious about that because I've always understood that this to be actually dangerous for a person's individual happiness and comparing yourself to others, but I'm not sure if that's what she was getting okay. at. So. so Maggie would like clarification around the issue of comparing. Is this dangerous to your happiness um, or can there be times when you can compare and it could actually enhance your happiness or is comparison always something that will result in unhappiness and misery? Thank you, Maggie, for the question. Thank you. Great question. And there's actually thoughts about on both camps. There is a group of folks who will say that 
we should not compare and that any form of comparison will eventually lead us to feel either overvalued, uh, over kind of inflated in a way, think too much of ourselves, or that it will make us feel like less than others because we compare ourselves. There will always be better people who are better off than we are. And so those, those folks will say, do not compare yourself. What the cognitive psychologists have found in general is that whether we want to or not, we compare ourselves. We would have to make great efforts and really go out of our way to not compare ourselves. So I'm going to assume that we are more or less uh, normal, untrained, unheroic human beings that tend to compare themselves and say that uh, comparisons are more the norm than not. Most of us compare whether we want to or not. And even just walking into a place where, for example, everybody seems happy or everybody seems sad will lead to a natural way of, of seeing. Are we as happy as they are? Are we as sad as they are? Are we as rich as they are? Are we as thin as they are? Whatever it is that we're comparing on. So, assuming that most of us compare anyway, we may want to be very careful about who we compare ourselves with. And perhaps know that we are multidimensional. And whatever comparison we are doing at the time is only a little tiny fraction of who we are and who the other people are and what this experience is and what the other experiences we're comparing to are. And take that in hold it lightly, to hold those comparisons lightly. I think that if we assume that we cannot help but compare, it is good philosophy, good psychology to hold a comparison slightly. Thank you so much. So unless anybody else has any questions, um, Jessica, you have a question. Um, so you had said that you are, you are, Jessica is the Youth Programs Director at the Unita um, Unitarian Universalist Association, and she's currently working on a multi-generational curriculum on, sp on spiritual happiness that asks participants to think about the correction, I'm sorry, the correlation between religion, faith, and happiness, as well as helping individuals define and work towards their own happiness. So Alexandra, if, if that, if you could um, talk to that. She, her question is, she has a question about the stories we tell ourselves. Is there any research on whether intentionally telling ourselves stories about being happy affects how we, how happy we rate ourselves? Uh, yes, there is there's substantial research on that area. And again, I'd like to refer you to Kahneman. It's not exactly a spiritual uh, place to look at. Um, there's also a fair amount of research on savoring, which I really like. And there is a book called Savoring that summarizes it. And one of the ways that people can uh, increase their happiness is with spiritual pursuits. Of course, um, religion has also made people very miserable at other times. So again, use it wisely. But it, it can have a lot of really positive effects. And again, I would highly recommend the book on savoring. Right. Thank you so much. So we, um, unless there's any other questions. So I want to apologize again for the technical difficulties at the start of this call. I hope that everybody enjoyed this call, and thank you so much to everybody for for staying on. I um, really appreciate your staying on the, on the call so, until we resolve the difficulties. We spoke earlier, Tom Barefoot and I, about the 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 genesis of these webinars, which we do monthly, which is the United Nations meeting to launch a global happiness and well-being movement. Um, these are talks to foster that. We've been having every other week. We have networking conference calls. We just open those up to, to people who want to work towards um, greater happiness in policy, in business, in education, and in for individuals. And you're welcome to join those calls. Just connect with Tom Barefoot or myself, and we'll, we'll uh, introduce you. The emails are in the question box on the, your right side of your, um, of your screen there. This call has been, um, this webinar has been recorded and we will be putting this up as with, with the deck, if you'll give it to us. 
uh, Alex on Basecamp. And if you'd like access to that, just shoot me or Tom an email and we'll get access to you for that. So thank you so very much. Next month in January, um, we have two webinars, actually. Tom will be giving a, a talk. Um, Tom, I'm going to unmute you. And if you want to give a little plug, that would be great. Go, Tom. Hi. Um, I'll be talking about the happiness movement and in particular the attempt to start measuring well-being for outcomes to measure development and progress and um, to, to sort of give us guidance for policy and planning purposes and then to see if we're actually getting any happier to measure mm -hmm. over time. And, and see if we can show whether we're getting happier or not and do something about it. Beautiful. Thank you. So this concludes our, our call. This is Laura Musikansky. I'm the executive director of the Happiness Initiative, where we take Bhutan's gross national happiness philosophy, and um, we have tools and resources, including that subjective measure of well-being that Alex talked about. Anybody can use at any scale. We give unique codes so that you can use this for your family. Um, we've got actually some families that are using it. We can you can use it for your organization, for your neighborhood, for a specific project or intervention, or for your city. So you can just visit happycounts.org to learn more about that and um, thank you so much Alex for, for working with us through the technical difficulties and for the beautiful presentation and um, thank you to everybody for staying on the call. I'm going to unmute everybody so that we can all say goodbye and okay. have a wonderful holiday season. It's going to get a little loud. <laughs> goodbye so, thanks to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you to everybody. Have a bye. wonderful holiday. Thank you. There you go. Just unmuting everybody. All right. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Wonderful holiday.